hey, Jordan, what are you doing right now? I'm subscribing to... Rational Ryan. So then the Fellowship debate about hiding Lothlorien. Boromir's all like, That woman in Lothlorien is dangerous! And Aragorn's all like, No, you! And one jump cut later, they're in Lothlorien. The pacing in this movie is so brisk, it's almost comical. I don't really have that much to say about Lady Galadriel's character design. I mean, she just kind of looks like an average pretty blonde. Nothing really pops out as someone of a different race other than human. But I will say that her perfectly designed face makes me wonder how they fucked up Legolas' design so badly. Now, as awful as the character development of this film has been up until this point, I gotta admit, this is one of the few moments of the film where the Fellowship genuinely feel like a Fellowship. They laugh, they have fun, they train with their weapons, they even have some really nice music playing in the background. It's a song about Gandalf, isn't it? Yes. Mithrandir was the elves' name for him. It means Grey Pilgrim. We knew so little of him in the Shire, Aragorn. He was just Gandalf to us. We never knew he had so many names. I think he was fondest of Gandalf. My only complaint is that it almost feels too little too late. Shouldn't we have had a moment like this earlier in the film? Maybe before they went off on their journey or before they went into the mines of Moria? I don't know, I feel like this should be the point of the film where the Fellowship is just completely wiped out and just need a rest. I mean, this was just a few days after they fought a bunch of orcs, escaped the Belrog, and again, lost Gandalf. Personally, I wouldn't exactly be all like, ah -ha -ha! so much fun right now! What an adventure! So then we get to the part of the film where Galadriel shows off her future-telling mirror made of liquid. If you look closely at the mirror, you can tell that it's not really animated. It's just a video of trippy effects green screened onto the film. Gandalf. No. No, it must be Arrowman. Wait, Arrowman? You mean Saruman? Wow, the voice actor fucked up the name they used to take anyway. Had to bring a wizard at all. Perhaps it should have been his friend Aruman. Oh my God, Arrowman! It happened again. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that for the rest of the film they're going to refer to Saruman as Aruman? Aruman. 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 Why? There is no explanation for this change whatsoever! If you're going to change a character's name from the book, at least be consistent about it. Now I just have to assume that this was a typo in the script and everyone just ran with it. So then the mirror forms into... I guess what's supposed to be the Eye of Sauron, but it just looks like a really weird desktop background or something a hippie would put on his wall. Then Frodo offers the ring to Galadriel and well, credit where credit is due, she's way nicer about it here than in the Jackson version. And I came to test your heart. You will give me the great ring freely, and in place of the Dark Lord, you will set up a queen. In place of a Dark Lord, you would have a queen! And I shall not be evil, but beautiful and terrible as the morning and the night. Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! Treacherous as the sea! Stronger than the foundations of the earth. Stronger than the foundations of the earth! All shall love me and despair. All shall love me and despair! Tell that fucking Mr. Kill! So then the Fellowship leave Lothlorien as they ponder on how to continue their journey. Shall we turn west with Boromir and go to the wars of Gondor? Or turn east to Mordor and its Dark Lord? Or shall we break our fellowship? I'm going with Mr. Frodo. I know that, Sam. God, even Aragorn is sick of Sam's shit. So as Frodo ponders to himself on how he should carry the journey, he is confronted by Boromir. Why should we fear to use the ring in a just cause? Boromir, whatever is done with the ring turns to evil. Gandalf and Elrond refuse to touch it, and Galadriel herself... Yes, yes, I know all that. And for themselves, they may be right, these elves and half-elves and wizards. But true-hearted men will not be corrupted. This conversation becomes so heated that it adds more detail to Boromir's facial design. And just like that, 
Boromir's face goes back to just having black dots as pupils. Then his pupils change again to- OH MY GOD! I don't even know how to describe this look. Seriously looks like someone sucked the soul out of Boromir. I don't know, maybe that's what they're going for with this scene. And then they go back to being black. Consistency? Heh, <laughs> fuck it, it's just aesthetics. So we all know what happens, Frodo disappears, Boromir begins to regret his rage, and the Fellowship split up to find Frodo. Follow me, Sam. Stay close. Woo, Sam Ganji. Your legs are too short, so use your head. What? You didn't even try. So on a complete whim, Sam finds the boat that Frodo snuck onto with the ring. Save me, Mr. Frodo! Help, I'm drowning! Wow, even when doing something as noble as helping out a friend, Sam finds a way to make himself look like an ass. And yes, this scene obviously happens in both the book and the Jackson movie, but listening to Sam's shrill voice say, Save me, Mr. Frodo! Help, I'm drowning! Just makes what could have been a really powerful scene look really undignified. Also, you're not technically drowning if you're hanging on to the side of the boat. We then cut to Merry and Pippin as they try to find Frodo and oh my god. They completely change color, design, and animation style as they run into the orcs. That looks awful. Then Boromir comes in to save the hobbits with his design completely unchanged. Well, almost completely. Wait, is that fireplace supposed to be the reason why everyone is red and shitty looking? Talk about limited resources. They couldn't even get the lighting right without overdoing it. We then get to the part where Boromir sacrifices himself to save Merry and Pippin. And... I got no complaints with this scene. It doesn't reach the same level of power as the Jackson version, but on its own, it's a nice short moment of badassery. Although, the purple blood on the orcs is just weird looking. So after Boromir dies, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli decide to search for Merry and Pippin while Frodo and Sam head for Mordor. Well, I should probably say Aragorn and Legolas decide because Gimli has barely any lines in this movie. I've seen people give the Jacksons film shit for making Gimli into a comic relief character. I'm trying to get this adjusted. It's a little tight across the chest. But come on, just give him something to do, or say, or kill, or whatever. Oh my god! <laughs> the actor playing Aragorn tripped and fell while shooting the real life footage. And instead of doing another take, they just animated <laughs> To the footage of him falling. <laughs> and it's so motion too as he gracefully falls onto the ground. <laughs> the movie then cuts to Merry and Pippin as they're running with the Yorks. They just keep running and running and running. One of them falls down, resulting in the medicine scene at the beginning of the two towers. Septira doesn't look like anything's going in his mouth, it's just splashing all over his face and chin. And then the orcs reveal that they're taking the hobbits to Isengard. And as the orcs start running away, I can't help but notice that some of them just look like regular people painted black. Hell, this guy's costume is flickering for some odd reason. So as Aragorn is finding clues as to where Merry and Pippin are, I can't help but notice that the height difference between Gimli and the other two isn't really that much different despite the fact that he's a dwarf. There will be no more signs! I cannot run all the way to Isengard! So, Peter Jackson wasn't the first person to come up with a comic relief version of Gimli? I wasted on cross country! We dwarves are natural sprinters! And then we're introduced to the writers of Rohan. They defeat the orcs that captured Merry and Pippin while looking weird and uncanny as fuck. Ew! Why does his leg look more realistic than the rest of his body? That is disgusting! We then cut to Frodo and Sam as they inch their way closer to- <sighs> God damn it, Sam. There's that Mount Doom again, Mr. Frodo. See it? What? Uh, where? You mean that mountain that blends in with everything else? You know, you think for a location that's so important to the story, they put more effort to make it stand out. As they walk closer to Mount Doom, they get stopped by Gollum who... Well, 
He's no Andy Circus in this version. Jumps on us like cats on poor mice. <laughs> Great, so now we've got two annoying characters as a part of this plot. Don't hurt us. Don't let them hurt us, please. Oh, don't let him hurt me, Don't let him turn me into anything unnatural. Mr. Frodo, he's gone. We'll be nice. Gotta go home. They dug up that chop bro and thrown my poor old gaffer out in the street. Hobbits won't kill Oh my! Hooray! Yes! Yes, indeed. Nice hobbits. Save me, Mr. Frodo! Help us, Frodo! So we then cut to Merry and Pippin, who try to haggle with one of the orcs before he gets shot and killed. As they escape, a fight scene ensues. And the choreography is decent considering how obviously rotoscoped it is. It's the kind of scene that would make audiences wonder, why didn't they just make a live action movie? And with no real transition, Merry and Pippin are just in Fangorn Forest. Walking all calmly, even though they were just running from orcs moments ago. And then Treebeard is thrown into the film. Now, fun fact about Treebeard, he's the only character in the film that is completely hand-drawn, with no form of rotoscoping whatsoever. As such, he's one of the few characters in the film that actually looks decent. It makes me wish that other characters in the film were completely hand-drawn. Like, I get with the main characters, they tried to go for a more sophisticated look, but the orcs, the trolls, and especially the Belrog could have looked way cooler if the animator had more freedom with his design and wasn't just limited to live-action footage that had to be traced over. We then cut to these three as they're still looking for clues, when all of a sudden... Look! Your bow leg it's Arrowman! Oh no, it's Arrowman. Thanks for warning us, Emily. Don't let him hurt... Ragorn. Better shoot him down, Egalos. <laughs> Egalos. Stop him, Legolas! Oh. Whoa, was that a lightsaber sound effect? Oh. 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 Huh. Didn't take too long after the first Star Wars film for people to start ripping off its effects, eh? So the cloaked wizard turns out to be not Saruman, ooh, sorry, I mean Aromon, but actually Andalf the Grey, or shit, I mean Gandalf the Grey. Except now he's Gandalf the White. Hope that's not too confusing. Anyway, so Gandalf explains how he became a white wizard. Long time I fell. Long I fell and he fell with me. His fire was about me. I was burned. Ever he clutched me and ever I hewed him far under the living earth until at last he fled back up the secret ways of Moria. As you can see, it's pretty clear that they didn't have the budget to animate a real fight between these two, so they just show off a bunch of still frames and concept art because this looks nothing like the Belrog that we saw earlier. It actually looks badass. It makes me feel bad that they couldn't animate this thing instead of that weird looking sports mascot with wings. I threw down my enemy and his fall broke the mountainside. But we couldn't show you that cool stuff, so here's some quick zoom ins on some scenery that you just saw. And I wandered far on roads that I will not tell. Naked, I was sent back. Well, actually, they were nice enough to give you a white robe, apparently, but whatever. So as they ride off, Gandalf exposited some info about King Theoden of Rohan. Theoden has grown old. He shivers by his fire now, and leaves everything in the hands of his new minister, Rhymer Wormtongue. So then they arrive at Rohan, as they deal with Theoden and Grimer Wormtongue. Now, am I the only one who thinks that Grimer looks kind of goofy in this version? I don't know, something about his face in combination with his short stature and costume. He looks less like someone who works for Saruman, I mean- Okay, maybe I should just stop harping on that. And more like a manlet, badly cosplaying as a Jawa. So after barely two minutes of work time being introduced to the audience, he's exposed as someone working for Araman. He's often at Isengard. I sent him there with messages. And he returns with poison. Is this so? I will not harm you, Grimer. Is it so? <laughs> oh, 
Jesus. You know, that scene was so dumb, I'm kind of at a loss for words, so... Here's an inside joke that only a few people would understand. Is it so? So right after Wormtum escapes, we're introduced to Eowyn. Not to be confused with Arwen, they're, they're two different characters. Yeah, I know, it's a little confusing. My sister daughter, Eowyn. My only loyal kin, since her brother has disobeyed my commands. Yeah, fun fact, this is the only scene that she's in. She doesn't have a single line in the movie, and her character was introduced to set up events that would happen in a part two that was never made. So yeah, that was pointless. So then Gandalf instructs Theoden to move the Riders of Rohan to Helm's Deep and splits up from the group. And because we were barely introduced to Theoden and he's already in armor, it's here that I honestly confused him for another dwarf. I mean, can you really blame me? That beard, that nose, and that helmet just reeks of I'm an elderly dwarf. We then cut back to Frodo, Sam, and Gollum as they walk towards Mordor. What? What the fuck did Gollum just say? Wraith! Oh, Wraith. Uh, the ring wraiths. I, I forgot about those. We then cut to Helm's Deep where for some reason, everyone's skin has changed color. What made the red man red? What made the red man red? And now we get to the famous battle at Helm's Deep. Everyone who saw the Jackson trilogy remembers this battle. Everything about this sequence was amazing, from the build-up, to the action, to the cinematography, the little moments like Legolas shield surfing, Aragorn throwing Gimli, all capped off with Gandalf's appearance at the end and the trees helping out with the battle, followed by Sam's fantastic speech about the great tales of old. And to be fair, this version of the battle at Helm's Deep, it's actually pretty fun to watch. I briefly talked about how good the soundtrack of this film is, but it's here where it really shines. The music does a great job at building suspense, and the chant of the Urukai gives me chills every time I hear it. Oh my god, I'm actually excited for this fight. This is one of the few parts of the soundtrack that I actually go back and listen to every once in a while because it's that good. So after the men shoot three arrows, the Urukai fire back, and the people at Helm's Deep JUST STAND THERE! Yeah, don't take cover or pull out any sort of weapon. It's not like those arrows can pierce through you or anything. Anyways, I don't have that much else to say about this fight. It suffers from some of the same animation problems that I discussed earlier, but the camera work is fine. You know what's going on. And the music is great, as I stated earlier. It's one of the few moments of the film where it feels like I'm watching an entertaining adaptation of Tolkien's work. So then these sparkly things appear and attack Helm's Deep, and then they have to retreat to the caves. Oh, thank God. We saved all of these still images from danger. So we then cut to Frodo and Sam, who talk about whether or not there will be a journey home. I reckon we got enough left to see us to this Mount Doom. But after that, I don't know. After that, if the ring goes into the fire and we're at hand, after that, dear Sam, I wouldn't worry. Oh, the ring is so heavy now, Sam. Sam? Frodo is bleeding his heart out about the journey and your responses is just blow him off? Really puts the whole dearest and most loyal friend thing in perspective now doesn't it? I made a promise Mr. Frodo. A promise. Don't you leave him Samwise Gamgee. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. Shit, I didn't come here to listen to you bitch about your problems. Come on Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you! Come on! So after that, we cut back to Helm's Deep as the Urukai try to break in. They are then driven away by the horns of Rohan. 
I love how this guy is just standing there, looking like he's bored out of his mind. Hey, uh, have you guys broken to Helm's Deep yet? Oh god! So Aragorn and Theoden see that they have the upper hand in this battle for once, and they get surrounded again. Then Theoden shouts for- And Gandalf appears with the Riders of Rohan to drive the Urukai away. Sorry for, for the quality, but I just noticed this as I was editing. There's this long shot in the film where Gandalf is just swinging at nothing during a battle. Like, <laughs> yep, yep, I'm uh, definitely hitting stuff. Yep, yep. <laughs> It's just so goofy. The forces of darkness were driven forever from the face of Middle-earth by the valiant friends of Frodo. As their gallant battle ended, so too ends the first great tale of The Lord of the Rings. Hey, wait, wait a minute. What, what happened? What happens next? Come on, let's see the next episode. That's it? What? Part two. It was cancelled after that. Wait, 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 wait! What about the- Giant Spider. And in the, and the Battle at Minas Tirith. There was a great- Book. I mean, why cancel it? Two words. Studio Interference. So, originally, Bashi wanted this film to be titled The Lord of the Rings Part 1 for obvious reasons. However, United Artists rejected this title because they didn't like the idea of advertising half of a movie, even though that's exactly what the movie ended up being. So yeah, as you can imagine, fans of the book were pissed at this ending when the movie was first released. And who can really blame them? Mind you, this is the same studio that only gave Ralph three million dollars to work on this film. Now that might sound like a lot of money when I say it out loud, but keep in mind, animation is a very expensive business, and at the time, Making an animated feature of this caliber would take a company like Disney eight times the budget at the very least. They even demanded for a holiday release in 1978 no matter what state the film was in, unfinished or not. And by the time the movie was released, Ralph just wanted to give up on the project because he was sick of doing adaptations. Who can blame him really? In short, this is yet another case of a studio running a potentially great animated film into the ground. It's just the same old story. Same old song and dance. By the way, shout out to Animation Lookback for the information of the production history of this film. Thanks for the info, Matt. I just really wish you would change your outfit already. So yeah, that was Ralph Bashi's Lord of the Rings and... <sighs> Alright, stop the music. Now, when it comes to these kinds of videos on my channel, this is the part where I make my closing statement of how bad the film is. Instead, I'm going to do something just a little bit different. I'm going to treat this video like a compliment sandwich. I mean, yes, from an objective standpoint, I don't think this is a good film, let alone a good adaptation of Tolkien's work. But I will give it this. This film is not the Lightning Thief. It's not the Fantastic Beast films. It's not Aragon, it's not Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and it's not the majority of films based on Grimm's fairy tales. In other words, it wasn't just your average film adaptation of a fantasy story where the people involved just wanted to milk money off a beloved property. As poorly executed as this film turned out to be, it was a labor of love on the part of Ralph Bakshi. Because I loved fantasies. Then I read Lord of the Rings and I went nuts. I mean, it was probably the greatest fantasy for realism. Here's a, Tolkien is so brilliant, so great. Um, Here's a totally believable world he put together. You know, every page, detail on what they're reading and how they look and how they feel. I've never read anything like it in my whole life to this date. I would love to live in a reality where a movie can be objectively good simply because they were made with a labor of love. But in a lot of cases, that's just simply not true. Now, I am not saying this is the worst movie ever made. Far from it. But it was simply held back by the limitations of its era, and the low budget it was given to by the studio. As I've stated before, there are points in the film where that love for the original story shines through. I love the battle at Helm's Deep. I mean, it seems like you can't go wrong with that sequence no matter who's at the director's chair. And I really like the scene where Frodo stands up to the ring race after he was stabbed. By all the Shire, you shall have neither the ring nor me! 
In fact, there are parts of this movie that served as inspiration for scenes that would later be seen in the Peter Jackson films. Much like with The Thief and the Cobbler, I can't help but wonder what this film would be like if everything went Ralph's way. I mean, yeah, a lot of the stuff that I criticize would probably still be there, like Sam being slow, Merry and Pippin being dull and forgettable, weird character designs, etc. But at the same time, would he have been able to animate the Belrog to look as cool as he did in the concept art? How would he handle Eowyn's character when she becomes a badass in Return of the King? I have to say, out of all the bad movies that I've covered thus far, this was the most entertaining to watch and the most fun to learn about. I may not be a fan of Ralph Bashki's version of The Lord of the Rings, but working on this video and learning more about him did make me appreciate him as an artist. Quite simply, Brownsville was a ghetto. A very Jewish, very black, very Irish, very Italian. Um, it was a very wonderful, wonderful place to grow up. Um, because of the different ethnic qualities to it that I enjoyed very much. The freedom of a, of a ghetto, meaning that there really was nothing we had to live up to. And we found that very important. In other words, nobody was chasing me to be a lawyer or a doctor or anything. You have that kind of freedom, you could afford to fail. And if you could afford to fail, you never worry. Too many people are worried about losing today, what people think of them, political correctness. That'll kill an artist. You know, if you're worried about what people would think, you're never going to do heavy traffic or Prince to Cat. I lived in a very mixed neighborhood, and never once in my house heard anything racist. Not once. Not, there wasn't a racist line said about any religion or any person. I grew up 100% clear of that. that. That also allowed me to treat people as I treat them. But it also allowed me to look at people as who they were. He drew what he saw. He drew the reality of things around him. He is not worried about it. He was never trying to prove a point. He was never trying to show people anything or demonstrate a huge idea. He was just trying to show what is. He always said that his stories are, he was the quiet guy in the corner just watching. What I tell people about Ralph is whether you like Ralph or hate Ralph, whether you like Ralph's films or hate Ralph's films, he made eight films in 10 years exactly how he felt like it. He didn't do focus groups, he didn't care what the marketing people said, he did what he wanted to do. And I think that's why he was successful. He got people to give him money to make animation when nobody gave a shit about animation. So, perseverance is something you get if you're doing something you truly love. And perseverance is something you don't have if you don't care about what you're doing. You think I would have gone to the extent I went with people and finding them if I didn't care about the films? He was a man that didn't take shit from anyone, made whatever fucked up movie he wanted, and made a lot of money out of it. That's the kind of artist I like to endorse on this channel.